aspect of the tournament as well. Yeah, and personally, I feel that I'm very interested to see how China do here. I do know that, yeah, obviously they lost quite strongly in the end to the Americas region, but they did get an awful selection of heroes in that last um, lobby. Um, okay, so let's have a look. We're straight into the action. I didn't realize we were going this quick. That's good. Uh, what have we got? We've got a cookie. What? What's that? An Omu on the bottom left? That is an Omu, yes. A server farm on the bottom right. Mm-hmm. Don't pick the blue thing. <laughs> that is a Vol'jin, I believe. They're going to pick the blue thing. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we shall see. What do you like out of that selection? I would probably go with the Vol'jin, but yes, I can't read the tribes, which is important information for whether or not uh, Vol'jin loses or gains a few percentage points in that regard. But it does end up being the Vol'jin, I believe, that was selected. Jalongi here on the Jandit. So there's likely tokens. We can see a Murloc, so there's at least a Murloc's in. Yeah. Not the Murloc she was looking for, though, obviously. Um, hope she gets a token next turn, because I like watching Jandis turn two tokens. It's, it's straightforward when you see it, but it's messy. Hooked us, Tyler, token. Talk about this if you'd love to start off, because that sounds like a dangerous combination of things. This is the lobby basically for uh, Tyler on Hook Tusk. This is the kind of lobby where Hook Tusk is closer to three average position than four, which uh, makes makes them by far away the best hero in the game when you get this double token lobby. Um, Murlocs are in, Beasts are in, Pirates are also in, which is a very useful minion to use as a token as well. And Quillballs are in, which gives you a 3-1 to buy as a target to then hero power and the 1-2 as a target to roll into from the hero power to then cash out afterwards. So Tyler hitting that token early on, on the hook task with the perfect lobby. Early days, of course, but I do think he has a small but significant edge over the rest of the lobby right now, just because of the hero he has and the way that the lobby is broken down in terms of tribes. So let's keep talking about Tyler just for a moment while these go through the, the opening throws. Um, what curve do you think, how, how low, how long will he stay low on hook to us trying to accumulate those triples? I imagine it will be shiny curve, staying on one for as long as possible, farming up triples, looking at, on hook task. You are super greedy. You're looking for two to three triples before you even start going up and mm -hmm. then start pushing up from there. We do see at the top, I believe that's <laughs> elementals, banned, yeah. elementals, dragons, mechs being banned, which means the quick power curve into the dazzling elemental is not there as we've been talking about throughout multiple games. Um, but it also means that you have to go pretty high for your triples overall because even the consolation prize of the Meccano tank is taken out of the game as well with the mechs being banned out. So this is very much a six drops lobby in my opinion, um, which means that if Tyler does stay very low and farm up triples for a long time, there is then a lot of work to be done in terms of leveling back up again. So we shall see. Picks up the Acolyte states and intention as well. Obviously, it is still one drop. So there's one going to take an Acolyte anyway. But yeah, there's a triple. Mm -hmm. Just get those heroes cleared up on APAC. They have got, oh, wow, they've got Jandis with tokens in. They've got Hook Tusk. They've got Diablo. We've seen what that can do. There's a lot of discussion about that. I'm sure we'll get into later. And there's a Sneeze. That looks like <laughs> a decent selection. Uh, la la la, hero powered, what was that, beast beast pirate through the opening turns. I believe you get the exact breakdown of what you have mm -hmm. hero powered over your three See turns. So two beasts and the pirate there were being offered from la la la. Uh, picks up the rat pack, which is pretty nice. Having his uh, cell level curve being the quill ball, getting that double blood gem means that he is going to be able to approach a tie against this Sneed. But I imagine, yep, kinder surprise, 2-2 two -two pops out and uh, la 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 is going to lose the fight. Yeah, and Sneeds is just so dangerous, the way it can defend itself early, and then because it can defend itself, it can level fast, and then it can just make big Sneeds things, like just dump the first things eventually and move on. And that happens so quickly. You enjoy, you enjoy the on Diablo. the Diablo fight now, or everyone on the Diablo fight, we should say. A uh, similar idea to what RDU was going for earlier with those uh, Sorolisks, just using them for those early tempo turns to make sure you're huge early on, make sure you can pick up those fights. But there is a couple of people who've spiked pretty hard already. You see, even on the other side, uh, Tao Tao has a pretty huge board state of uh, his own that will be able to challenge. Having a 5-9 is a lot of potential attacks that can challenge that 5-5 on the right-hand side for you, Joy. 
It's also a key number trying to get that 5-5, five, five, as you say. Just make it a 5-9. That'll be deliberate on his part to mm -hmm. give him every chance. It's not just a random number. It's actually a known break point. You don't get those very often in Battlegrounds. You get, I assume they've got an Acolyte. I want to have a 3-3 three, three to face off against it, that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, knowing you're going into a battle where they're definitely going to have a 5-5 five, five does enable you to manipulate your numbers just a little bit if you are on something like Quillbores. I always feel like any turn where you rope out without having used your hero power as Vol'jin, you've missed something, but I stared mm -hmm. at that turn for as long as possible and I couldn't find it, so I'm going to assume there was no upside. Yeah, that's okay, one point. attack goes down. These rats spawning are going to be an issue now because this is another taunt that has to get pushed through here, and that means that this 5-2 is going to go straight into that 2-3 and the 5-5 will survive for Yunjoy. Something I was talking about earlier in RDU's game where he did have the big tempo with the Sorrowlist, but he didn't have the taunts. Yunjoy had best of both worlds. Best of, uh, a little bit of tempo from the Sorrowlist, but also those sewer rats spawning those taunts nice and early, which means I would not be surprised if this is a full hand coming out, and it absolutely is. Yep, she won the two we saw, but you can see from the lobby, she's hit the top of the lobby, which means she probably beat everybody, unless somebody down the bottom who was already down there did, so happens to win. But yeah, full hand, and Yunjoy... We'll be looking to hold on to these as long as possible. We saw that strategy from RDU earlier. Just play one or two to keep yourself going. Because um, some of these cards you, you can't play through, right? You just dump the pairs of <coughs> sigils and Correct. secrets. Yeah. And get to that turn eight where hopefully that's where it's all decided. We saw RDU wipe out four people in one game earlier. We also saw Celestalon, the game developer, or one of the hmm. game developers, Doing a Celestion thing, explaining that he believes that this might be just an S tier hero. Yeah, I mean, it's a very easy topic to have hot takes on because either way, the hero is not going to be around long enough for anyone to be <laughs> definitively right or wrong about the issue. But I will say, I do think there's kind of a rejection of data in the battleground scene, which I find a little bit strange overall. Um, because, you know. There's a ton of data out there, like 62,000 games I think I referred to earlier. And, um, you know, one high roll on stream is not going to change my opinion on what 62,000 games worth of data at 10k MMR say. So I'm sticking it, to my guns for now. Just to go on with that, because I'm not getting involved, I'm just stirring it up as usual, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. have an opinion and then just cause trouble and, you know, see what happened. Um, but I do believe there's this sort of feeling amongst the very top players that top 1% data isn't good enough because the top 1% of players have a very wide range of skill. I mean, yes it is. It's 10k MMR up until 14, 15k MMR where the very, very top players are. But I think also some of that comes down to something we were talking about earlier, right? Where everyone feels like they're a specialist on a certain thing because they've lent mm -hmm. their uh, their practice and their testing towards that one thing so yes it's an argument that we could go around in some circles for and it's an argument that very much exists in constructed and everything else as well where uh you know mass data over smaller sample size with a higher level player that's a debate that will always happen but Again, even like I don't think the, the the statement I made is that Diablo is a tier two hero. Which yeah, I you don't say it was garbage or anything. Exactly. I don't think it's incredibly controversial. Um, as we watch Tyler here, just hook tusking all over the place. Um, I've got a, a slightly more I don't know talkable point for you because I know you're into talking about Avenge. Uh, it has mm. seemed that Avenge, because of the nature of who are playing in these lobbies, Avenge is a little bit less good because the proliferation of tanks, I know there's not in this particular lobby, there's no mechs, but as we're watching Tyler just build up this massive board, uh, do you think there is something to the fact that Avenge might be a bit less good because everyone's kind of half countering it or side countering it? Yeah, I do. It took me by surprise a little bit, to be perfectly honest, because of just how hyper-aggressive the lobby is. Not only looking for Meccano tanks, but also we've seen a ton of soul jugglers as well, which is the next best thing in terms of just dealing a ton of damage early on. And that's really what a lot of the games were about. Certainly, that Europe versus uh, Americas series that we watched was one of the most tempo-focused uh, matchups I've ever seen, one of the most tempo-focused lobbies I've ever seen, or multiples of them, as it was many, many players just under threat of death the entire time while being incredibly strong themselves. So I do think that is holding back a little bit from the ability of uh, for players to do what they ideally would like to, and that's milk up some big Avenge minions. But even in this lobby in particular, even if players wanted to do that, the options really aren't even there to do so, because this yep. is about the worst possible lobby for, uh, for big Avenge options. Ooh. 
Yeah, this is very much a, a, a traditional lobby. Lobbies that sort of people who've played on and off for a few years will understand a lot more easily. And Delonghi there has not got anywhere on the Jandis. This is it. She's quite late to the scene here. It feels like nine gold is a bit late to be getting this triple. Yeah, nine gold and nine health as well. So easily in one shot range for this Omu fight coming up. Uh, does pick up the brand now, which is a big deal. Has the uh, Sefin, which means that uh, she can start to pick up um, some nice triples off this brand. But she's going to need a, a Burgurgle, certainly, to go with this to protect some tempo. Drop that Sefin alongside it. Hope that a few poisons can get her out of it. She really is printing gold and printing triples uh, with these Murlocs. But she is going to need a lot of help very quickly. Picking A, the tempo minion, and you describe it earlier with a hog of the minion. Might get her out. Okay, go. The gurgle is huge. Sefin comes down. You are making six sixes and six fives here, so arguable whether you are keeping one of those over the taunt, especially when the taunt is juicing up your revenge procs for the Sefin. So I do think I like holding on to the acolyte here in the end. And then wow, actually going full defense in the end here. Selling the Bran with a board full of Murloc just to try and protect an extra turn or two. Uh, pick up the poison and it looks like that she has resigned herself just essentially to poison scan for the rest of the game from this point by giving up on that Bran scaling. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel about that? This is, personally, it looked weird, but the more I think about it, as you were talking about it, she's in so much trouble that she just has to win this fight. Uh, but I don't see how she wins the next one with a couple of I think that's a very, very good decision, honestly. And right. I think having put herself in this spot, first off, you can see this pay out immediately, right? Yep. Like that extra, that extra, the extra poison, the extra little bit of strength that she got from the Imprisoner, the extra 1-1s one coming through, all of that good stuff immediately held on to that fight. But now don't remember, you said an extra, an extra couple of poisons. She gets to poison her whole board over two turns, right? Because she gets two poisons off that fight with the two, with the Avenge, sorry, with the Reborn Taunt and the Death Rattle Taunt that she picked up. She then gets to do that again in the next fight if she wants to, to poison any remaining Murlocs that weren't poisoned. So that is a ton of poison scam early on for anyone's board to try and compete with on the other side. So I do think she's given up on winning the lobby with the line that she took, but it's, you also have to understand sometimes in Battlegrounds, that's the, the correct thing to do, right? Sometimes you're just so weak and your triples roll in a certain way or you're just not hitting the triples and you have to resign and say, okay, I'm playing for fifth, I'm playing for fourth. If I can get into third, fourth, this will be a dream scenario for me. And I think that's what's happening on this game when, uh, when she gave up on the France game. Yeah, it looked like a turn three or possibly even a turn four token that she decided to roll with there because she had nothing on turn one for sure and it looked very, very slow. So something went wrong and she just she failed and then she got given the token. So it's like, ah, oh, I've still got time. And went for it, but this isn't the Diablo turn. This is where you enjoy gets to reap the benefits of that turn four massacre. Can she do it again? And this is looking very similar to the board RDU had on turn eight earlier today. It is looking remarkably similar indeed. Yeah, loading up all the loot, dropping Wind Fury on a big Soralisk, which I believe was the exact same thing RDU yep. did as well. Uh, difference is that Enjoy has already tripled here into the Pale Scale which I don't believe RDU had done at this point, but still immensely strong. And again, would not be surprised if she does do a ton of damage and pick up multiple kills here. Yeah, this is the turn earlier uh, where RDU did actually put four people out of the game. This lobby is a bit higher health. I don't think you enjoy will be able to kill that many people off, but yeah. it's going to look good for her after this turn, I think. Watching the action unfold for a moment here. Yeah, indeed. Out. Certainly in the right hand fight, she looks like she has more than enough to have all this covered. Um, La La La's doing the thing, by the way. Um, there's an S Matron and a bunch of rats on that board, so hopefully, we get a chance with La La La's next turn, win or lose on this fight. Uh, because he's accumulating a large amount of gold. Yeah, didn't get the full milk, though. Did lose out on an extra two to three procs from the nest matron because it um, ate the hit before the rat detonated but that is a lot of value already uh, picking up three procs off the nest matron one of them being a tide hunter 
representing two gold. That's a ton of extra gold for him this turn. Yeah, and to just watch all those health bars just go down. DeLonghi had a very good run there, as predicted. Yeah, and Tyler has done the thing, as I described. Looks very much like he uh, stayed down quite a lot early on, and now you have seen him make his way very safely all the way back up to Tavern 5, taking triples into Tavern 6 minions, while still having that 19 HP buffer. So uh, turn 9 at the moment, no one dead at this point. Tyler knows he can be as greedy as he likes. Zero chance of dying because of the damage cap that was introduced into the game. So he can still afford to be taking setup turns here. And that is beautiful. Played for and got, says Dave Lister, <laughs> as Tyler throws down the Defender of Argus. Hero powers it into exactly the bird to be able to prop that uh, um, gold ring. Just want to point out that you said that nobody died. That means Yunjoy survived with her Murlocs on the Jandis and now will be in a position to find another Bran or something and just get rolling from that point on. Yep. Brands, Myxnas, Reborns, Divine Shields, whatever she can find to make that board just scam a couple of extra places because that's all she's trying to do. This is free real estate at this point. Any position she climbs out of 8th, is profit at this point because she made the correct read on the situation of understanding that she needed to go for something a little bit different than the standard brand scaling. She would have been dead already from what we saw of just taking the conventional line. Yeah, we saw this from Simi yesterday actually against APAC, not in nowhere near the same sort of play where she had to dump a long term board, but she just went for a couple of tempo turns knowing she was dead, survived on one, came fourth or fifth, and they won by one point up three lobbies. Nice. And although Radu grabbed the headlines, you know, those, those two or three points scammed further down are just going to keep you going. She has here hit the worst possible matchup, though. She just has six or seven poisons with her board laying out and Divine Shield. These multiple layers of death rattles with the Baron is a big problem for her to fight back against on the other side. We're just looking at this. No, look, fairly healthy. Yeah, but right now everything's everything's just marching through in order. Okay, that's a big deal. We'll see how much juice is left in this other side here. Oh, the imp matron! The imp matron is so thick. Uh, nope, always dead from that point. Yeah, and didn't quite hang on. So good move, not rewarded as it happens. Still gets that eighth place, but does show how much of an emergency it was. Which Moved it so massively in the short term and still died just by one or two health there as well. Very good chance of her of going up the ladder there. So that's unfortunate. Yeah, even then we can see if she held out. Yeah, I mean, even that, she held out to die in seventh, eighth with someone else, right? Which is still a microscopic improvement over what would have happened with the other line. Deserve better, I think I would say. That's actually a, a smart piece of play that we have seen today. Really good recognition of the situation, as you said. Not necessarily rewarded to the degree it could have been because of that matchup RNG, right? When you are just yeah. straight up poison scam, the one thing you don't want to be seeing is Sneed on the other side because those layers upon layers of death rattles are easily going to break through uh, a series of Murlocs that don't have the brand buffs, right? Because you had to sell your brand away to uh, prevent yourself getting those huge health totals. Hey, it's rapidly getting to the point where I never want to see Sneed on the other side, no matter what the state of the game, I don't think. It's Fair. getting ridiculously strong. Right, La 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 is still building up on the... Um, he's cashing in, sorry, on the Avenge he used earlier on, so... That board has gone from not a lot into a pretty giant looking beast board in very little time because all this free money accumulated. Took his damage all the way down to four, which is something you've been advocating, and now is sorting it out with what he gained. Indeed, yes. Hero powering beasts as well, which, yes, he is full, pretty much fully into beasts at the moment with his board. Um, but I imagine if he has any intentions of going to six anytime soon, uh, switching to shooting beasts is something that you would quite often divert into late game with Cookie, just because you open up my Exner as a hit, which is, you know, one of the generically strongest minions that you can get in most late game situations. Because if my Exner's in, then the Reborn Snake is in. And the, the combination of those two cards together are basically a welcome addition to any comp in the game if you can pick them up. So seeing Cookie even not on beasts switch to beasts in the late game is a fairly common sight, but no surprise that La La La's going for it here with uh, all the upside he has for extra beast synergy with his existing board. Yeah, hitting a Golder in here would be huge as well in the short term, obviously, with the Golden Parrot hanging about. We all know what that does. 
So pretty terrifying on top of the Makes Us Energy you described. I haven't seen PF much. We'll look at what's left of his board over here. Um, well, there's an Amalgadon. That's always a good sign for an Omu. Yeah, it's going to be in a potential little bit of issue here, depending on where these last couple of attacks oh. go. Not there. That's not where you wanted it to go. Okay, hits the lowest possible damage amount that could come out of the uh, Imbama in that spot, which is should be enough to see him survive from this position. Yeah, it was looking very iffy there. If the last thing goes into the Imbama again, it just drops one of those nightmares that it can sometimes do to you. But yes, he survives mm. and seems to be quite strong, but we need to look at that again because he did lose that fight. Yeah. Lost the fight to, again, similar story to what we were talking about in the Europe versus Americas uh, series, right? Is Island Cat is just full tempo here with uh, demons and a single soul juggler. But more and more, we start to see the games not really go long enough to reach the point where full tempo boards really got punished and outscaled by their late game counterparts because... We are already seeing that scenario, right? With uh, Diablo in the lobby in particular, right? I think Diablo accelerates the lobby quite significantly. That's one thing that is very difficult to argue with because of that ability to kill two, three, four people in the same fight. Even if you don't kill four people in the same fight, just dealing late game damage to four people in the same fight is still a very, very big deal in terms of speeding up the lobby. And then by extension, that means that these kind of tempo boards with soul jugglers or with uh, mechano tanks can just hang out for a little bit longer and actually reach those top two positions that normally they'd be falling off around top four. Yeah, Island Cat's got one of those builds that just looks like he's done really nicely with what he's got. Picked up the Amalgadon. Tried to, he spent a long, long time thinking about this turn as well to work out how to get the Amalgadon to sort of do something. Got an okay roll on it as well, but there's no Divine Shield buff for it anywhere hiding. He's not able to get that. So it's just a random poison minion at this point. I like this diversion as well. Um, obviously, we don't necessarily see the thought process, but I think what happened is Island Cat moused over his opponent, saw B6, understood what that meant, and knew that no amount of soul jugglers and demons were going to kill six beasts and a baron, which is what B6 generally mm -hmm. means when you see it in that late game position. Tried to switch as quickly as he could to his own poison scam, uh, similar to what we saw earlier from the Jandis, but we can see it's nowhere close. But it was at least an idea, and an idea was better than no idea. I think going into that fight with the Soul Juggler comp was straight up conceding, having checked what your opponent was playing, which I'm sure he would have done. Yeah, and Tyler tearing through the lobby on that hook just really. Yep. 36 on the high main is going to be enough to chew through all this stuff on the Omu side as well, which means it looks like Omu is going to go down and we are going to have another very, very good performance from uh, Diablo here going into uh, top two. Yeah, against the teammates. So APAC are going to be in an okay position because they're going to pick up the, that bonus point for winning the lobby as well. And now we get the, the exciting bit for the cast is where the players are taking it deadly serious and we know it doesn't really matter, but it'll matter to both of these players for different reasons. Tyler always wants to win everything he does as do most of us of course and usually yesterday she'll be feeling a little bit of pressure because she was the last person to make a mistake on the team yesterday which is really unfair right because she was the one who was in the position to save the match in the first place um, but she did. Oh, really? What happened? Oh, was this the, the poison that didn't get on the board or something? Yeah, she, she had a poison that was going to give her probably, I don't know exactly, but sort of a 30 to 50% chance of winning the final fight, and she timed out. Okay. That is certainly unfortunate. You can see I mean, she's a seasoned pro, though, because on her first roll of the turn, she hit a triple Icky Imp and did not even pause to smile with bemusement at the triple that she was given. Just rolled straight past it and kept on going. That's how you know it's serious time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, the bird person's just been there the, a significant amount of time. I keep highlighting that because I know you like to highlight how I didn't like bird person enough. <laughs> I haven't even uh, mentioned it. You're just burying yourself. I, I've, I've just learned from Raven. Yeah, fair enough. Don't let Sotl bury you. Just get there first. <laughs> okay. Looks like Tyler's board is huge. Tyler's board is indeed huge, yes. I 
think even with the addition of the extra huge minion on uh, Yujoi's side, which is going to come on the far right any time now, still very unclear as to when exactly it decides to show its face, but there it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think Tyler should have still more than enough to have this covered. Uh, the simple problem, though, is that he's extremely unlikely, I would say, to be picking up a lethal this turn. Um, but it does mean he will have access to the loot and Yujoy will not as you get down into this head-to-head -head scenario, which should set him up very, very nicely for just being able to do the same thing again on a future turn. Yeah, he also has the more straightforward game plan, just trip all the things you've got, maybe get another poison, maybe right. find a Hydra, that's probably too late for Hydra, probably not required with the herb board, actually big enough. And Yujoy still has to make the <laughs> comp a little bit more cohesive. Yujoi trying very hard to die on that turn, filling up the board, crashing into the mama, just trying as hard as possible to take a huge amount of damage. But yeah, so unlikely to be able to get lethal there. But you see the uh, the balance of power just shifts so uh, so easily into uh, Tyler's side. He instantly levels, uh, looking to pick up more Goldrins, more Myxners, all of that good stuff that we were talking about. Yujoi is still so many pieces away from being able to compete with that. Yeah, what does she even look for here on Tavern 5? I, I can't think of many things off the top of my head that will really help her. Pass. I mean, Zap is a good start, but you would also expect your opponent, um, now that the, the hands have been shown to each other, because Quill Balls are in, to look for Quill Balls as a matter of, um, matter of urgency. But the rest of Tyler's minions are so huge that it's actually kind of hard for him to play around it in this position. However, the rest of Tyler's minions are so huge that that whole dynamic doesn't really matter anyway because the rest <laughs> of Tyler's minions are so huge they're going to value trade you all anyway. So, short answer, don't know. And if you don't know, defaulting to poison is usually not going to be far from wrong. Okay, I'm going to need some help on that one. Oh, he's got another bird. Okay, I wonder why he saw the bird. But there was one hiding under his... Um image so now yeah. I understand you need the space. That's easy now. That's good. Happy. Indeed. Is there anything I should know about the positioning of this bird? It seems like a quite a, a weird place, sort of the other side of the Goldrin. Yeah, it's because he he's never got strong enough with a Goldrin to fully go all in on just bird plus Goldrin. So he's still kind of hybrid mama bear comp, right? So you can see mm -hmm. with the way this works out, by putting the parrot where it is, he's saying, okay, I'll just let the Goldrin go off once. And then by allowing those taunts on the left to clear out the way first, I'm guaranteeing myself some actual death rail value with the bird itself. So it's a decent consolation prize for just not being able to get those massive Goldrin props that he would have been looking for. I think it's a very smart positioning overall. Yep, and he is going to take down this lobby unless I've missed something that even I should you be able have to miss. not. Yeah. I wasn't even looking at the hundreds at the top. I guess I missed that. Could have been more confident if I just read the numbers. <laughs> nice work from Tyler. Nice work from you, Joyce. She'll get the good news that her teammate was the other person heads up and that APAC, at a glance on the leaderboard, I haven't added it up, are going to have a, a smallish lead going into lobby number two. Yeah, APAC 1-2 is certainly a very big deal there for sure. Um, but we did see APAC in eighth as well. So that mm -hmm. middle of the pack did seem to be mostly populated by the China players. We'll uh, see if we get any breakdown of the scoreboard before we go into the next lobby. But certainly when you get the 1-2 in a lobby, you would expect to be opening up a decent lead in your, uh, your first lobby of the day. Two more to play, of course. Um, each region matchup is essentially three individual lobbies uh, the scoring works a little bit different to the other formats because you end up you know winning 61 to 43 against your opponent or whatever but it still equates to the same maximum two points to the overall tournament score and um, that all of the other styles of event do as well yeah even though it's two points per per thing per discipline the battlegrounds feels more important because it's always lumpy you can't get that one one tie you always get a two or a zero and so we, I've seen a few people saying, oh, why is the Battlegrounds worth more? It's not, but it does feel that way. Um, over the course of the tournament, the Battlegrounds is worth exactly the same. Yeah, and... it's it's one of those mental tricks that uh, Lorinda will argue with you and come up with some very convincing sounding weird words that make it sound like he's a genius, but it's not. You can ignore him. It's fine. It's worth the same as everything else. 
X, yeah, it, it really is. <laughs> um, yeah. And when you see the scoreboard at the end of the day, there'll just be twos, ones, and zeros by people's by teams' names, and that'll be just lost in that shuffle. Uh, but the points are added up onto the uh, whole total. It's not just a match between the two teams, and the two points here would put APAC level with China, and losing would put them four points behind in that league table. So. It's a good yeah, and there we do see the results of that first lobby. We see first, second, fifth, and eighth. That So that fifth from uh, Jinbei is actually quite a big deal. Uh, if that fifth had been a seventh or a, th a sixth instead, then the lead would not be looking anywhere near as impressive going into the second lobby. But the fact that he was able to creep up close to that top four to support the first and second uh, from Tyler and Yoonjoy is a very, very big deal there. Again, Huge respect, even though it was an eighth with the Jandis in the end. Sometimes you play well and you don't get rewarded, right? And that's why games like Battlegrounds are games of averages and why you look to play.